The uh, motion passes uh, to your bill as amended, Senator Ralph. Yes, just uh, so that we understand, the amendment does take out the bonding uh, portion of the bill. Uh, we are moving forward with strictly a study proposal. Uh, what this bill does is bring something to the table that, it, that its time has come. Uh, when the commuter rail was built up to Big Lake, uh, there were no, there was not a complete set of trackage that ran to St. Cloud. So there would have been significant impediments to trying to bring that, bring the system to St. Cloud. That issue has been resolved. There are now full dual track all the way to St. Cloud. The thing that we must look at in terms of North Star is all, all public transportation of whatever nature has some sort of public subsidy involved in it. Roads and bridges, of course, are basically, we don't have toll roads, so it's basically the full, the full cost is shared, is put in the, on the government. We have other areas where we do subsidize, and the reason we do that is, is there is a public purpose served by public transportation. Uh, in the case of St. Cloud, there is a significant advantage to having North Star come to that. Those are not only economic, but social. North Star to St. Cloud will provide a significant benefit to the disabled community, making it easier for them to access things in the, in the Twin Cities and actually in, in areas in between. Additionally, there is a significant need for people to be able to travel back and forth in terms of education and also for medical treatment in addition to the economic benefits that will come from being able to move workforce in either direction. So as a, as a basic public policy, it is something that we certainly should be considering in terms of the cost that the, that the state will be uh, assuming because of the fact that as everyone has been able to see, there is probably not a full uh, uh, ability of the rail to support itself just on the box receipts alone. However, that being said, by bringing the train to St. Cloud, it is anticipated that a significant increase in box receipts could occur. That will lower the subsidy cost and will, make, and will actually be a positive benefit. With this in mind, I'd like to call my testifiers. I'd like to introduce Teresa Bonin, who is the uh, St. Cloud Chamber of Commerce uh, Director, I believe, is it? President. President. Ms. Bonin, uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record, who you are with, and proceed with your testimony, please. Thank you, Chair Newman and committee members. My name is Teresa Bonin, and I'm president of the St. Cloud Area Chamber of Commerce, which encompasses St. Cloud Weight Park and Sock Rapids, uh, as well as other area businesses. We have about 1,000 business members in the greater St. Cloud area. Again, St. Cloud Weight Park, Sartell, Sock Rapids, St. Joe, and St. Augusta. Um, St. Cloud is about a, a 60 to 65,000 people, and if you look at the bigger MSA, it about doubles, so we're talking 125,000 people that this would affect. Um, our companies have long said yes to this. Their main concern about North Star is that the schedules accommodate a reverse commute. So not only could people from our area travel to the Twin Cities if they choose to for employment, that we could encourage those coming from the Twin Cities into St. Cloud and that we have a schedule that supports that. So we will be further working on that as we develop um, the service in our area. So the companies are pretty much um, for it. Our chamber has a long history of support for over a decade since this first um, came to be. And individuals are saying yes as well. Um, if We had a house transportation hearing in St. Cloud a couple of weeks ago. I was astounded by the number of people, individuals who showed up and by the diversity of those people. We had um, employees, general employees, when I came over on a trip, I encountered um, someone from a law firm in town. I just came to talk up North Star and the importance of North Star to his business and the community. Um, companies, employees, students. We have SCSU, the, the St. Cloud Technical and Community College, as well as St. John, St. Ben's, and a number of private colleges that students could commute back and forth um, using the train. We also um, have people with disabilities, and you'll hear their perspective in just a minute. So 
all individuals in our area have a stake in this and really, at this point, want to see it finished and completed. It makes economic sense to get this train all the way to a regional center where people can travel and use the services that we have there, um, medical as well as retail, as well as education and government um, that we have available in St. Cloud. So my, my urged, urgence to you is, is to, to pass this bill through committee, let it move forward, let us find out with the study exactly what we're dealing with. Um, we really think that you should start what we began before other communities um, are, are brought into the whole commuter rail um, discussion. And I know this wasn't popular with Representative Murphy, um, as she'd like one in Duluth, but we, we really think you need to finish what you started and thank you get very, this to St. Cloud. Th so yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Bonin. Uh, next on my list would be Kim Petman, uh, an advocate. Uh, please state your full name, uh, Ms. Petman, uh, who you are associated with, and proceed with your testimony, please. Yeah, um, pull, pull the mic right up. And yep. Okay, Kim very Putman. Good. Thank you. Um, I do a lot of things. One of the things I do is I'm a transit advocate, and um, I used to live in the metro, and I've lived in the St. Cloud area for six years, and I've been a lifelong transit user, and I also did drive. So um, to get this out of the way, because people might be curious, I'd like to explain um, my disability. Um, I am disproportionately overweight, and that's from something called lipoedema. 17.4 um, million women have that. And I have lymphedema, and I also have something called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome hypermobility type. So what that means is my body is super bendy. I can dislocate joints just by sitting still, and I'm in lots of pain. So um, I'm going to explain a portion of the trip and explain why I believe this study would be very helpful. Um, I am no longer able to take the five to six part trip um, due to some of the changes in my mobility and also because of a couple vehicle changes. Um, in the past, what I would do is I would get up at four in the morning, have no PCA because of the worker shortage, get picked up at 5.30 from our paratransit, which is like Metro Mobility, it's called Dial-A-Ride, get to the transit station, take the 6.15 North Star Commuter Link bus, arrive in Big Lake, That's the, what, that was a choke point for me, and I'll come back and explain that in a second. I'd get off in Anoka or Coon Rapids, my mom would pick me up, then I'd take Metro Mobility to here. So all of that, four o'clock to maybe 10, 10.30, one way. And that's really hard. So um, it's great that there are the North Star Link buses, but they don't work well for everyone. It's great that they do have the lifts, but only two people needing accessible seating can fit on that bus. So if a group of more than two people wanted to use the bus, they're out of luck. Um, in the past, it was really hard to make the connection because sometimes it's a six to 10 minute turnaround time. So the driver would have to get me on the lift, get down, I'd have to make it over to the train and have them be able to see me. So I just missed the connection once. I can't go that fast and if I try, I can dislocate more things, I could fall, I am a fall risk. And right now, I don't feel comfortable recommending to my friends who have disabilities to take this route. So many things can go wrong, and if one thing goes wrong, you can be stranded. It can happen more on the weekends because there's not as much um, connectivity, um, but it's, it's very, very hard. So one of the things that could happen with a study is all people could be taken into consideration and their voices could be heard. And also by removing that section of the trip, it would be much easier. I believe the ridership number would go up 
and it would be uh, so great to meet Olmstead goals in our state. And those goals are to keep people living as independently as possible within their own communities. It would help get more workers to help with a health care and direct worker shortage. So I'm very much in favor of the study, and I would ask that you would vote for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Petman. Uh, next up, Mr. Qualley. Welcome to the uh, committee, Mr. Qualley. Nice to see you. Uh, please say your, uh, your name for the record in full and who you represent and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Philip Qualley, uh, State Director for the uh, Railroad Workers uh, in Minnesota, representing uh, workers on Amtrak, uh, North Star Commuter Rail, BNSF, Union Pacific, Canadian National, Canadian Pacific, and several short line railroads. Um, thank you very much for hearing this bill, and we'd like to thank Senator Ralph for bringing it forward. We understand, if I may ask one question, it is correct that there is an appropriation for this study. This is may I ask, Mr. Chairman? Uh, uh, Senator Ralph. I'm sorry, I missed the question. I, uh, Mr. Qualley, repeat your question, please. Thank you. I just want to clarify, while the bonding provision of the bill has been taken out, there is an appropriation for the study? That's Senator correct. Ralph. Thank uh, you so th very Mr. much. Mr. Chair, that's correct. Mr. Qualley. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman, Senator Ralph. Yeah, we support this legislation. I'll be brief. Uh, we think the study is necessary. Uh, when we're looking at commuter operations uh, across the United States and uh, at uh, interstate and interstate corridor service, passenger rail services, um, it's really an apples and oranges uh, uh, comparison. And with North Star Commuter Rail currently, uh, it is operated by the Med Council, which is essentially under the FTA's authority. And we believe the study can delineate what is the best and most efficient operation of the proposed line, whether it's FTA, uh, Med Council, uh, or if it's part of an inter or intrust state uh, passenger rail service in a state corridor service. Um, I just want to mention briefly that um, Minnesota's future is dependent on remaining competitive in a national and world marketplace. Uh, efficient and integrated passenger service across Minnesota is a key component that can lead to exponential business growth and improved quality of life for all Minnesotans. I will simply close by saying, um, if I may, that uh, the railroad line that we're talking about, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe, former Northern Pacific main line, is beautiful railroad. Uh, it is double main line, 60 mile an hour freight. Uh, it has centralized traffic control, positive train control, and uh, really well engineered. The track geometry and the condition of the line is one of the finest in the United States. And quite frankly, we're ready to operate the service now. We think that the numbers will hopefully show that there's strong um, numbers of people in the metropolitan area as well as in St. Cloud that can support a service. And again, we ask that as we look at costs and expenses that we be aware that uh, the exponential growth and the benefit to our tax and revenue bases from expanded business and opportunities. So thanks so much for hearing us. Thank you, Mr. Qualley. Uh, questions from members? Senator Howe. And thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Senator Ralph. As, as you know, I'm a supporter also. I, I guess there's a, I have my own bill that actually does the study all the way to Ripley. My question is, is it, when we looked at the $850,000 and we looked at the original bill, it looked like it was going to do many more things in the, before the amendment. My question is, is, and maybe this goes to fiscal staff, if, if they don't use the total $850,000 for the study, what happens to the excess? Ms. Boyd, can you handle that question? Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Howe, um, the $850,000 appropriation in fiscal year 20 is a one-time appropriation um, and would cancel back to the general fund after um, the end of the biennium in 2021. We could make it available only in fiscal year 2020 if that would make people more comfortable and then it would cancel at the end of that year. Other questions by any members? Senator Dibble. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I apologize, I was out of the room meeting with some constituents in the hall, so maybe this has already been articulated, but uh, um, did, uh, did we, do we understand uh, why we're opting uh, not to do any, any bonding for the purpose of, um, uh, or put any bonding dollars in place for the purpose of uh, bonding eligible expenses such as uh, pre-design or um, land acquisition, et cetera, and why uh, we don't want a legislative report Senator Ralph. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Dibble, uh, this is good government. <clears throat> we don't want a ready shoot aim here. We want to be very specific on how we're going to ultimately spend the money. So we, we feel that having the study will tell us exactly where we should be focusing in terms of those ultimate development dollars. There are still several significant questions that need to be answered. Where should we put additional stops, if any? How we're going to schedule it? the uh, uh, potential ridership, also the potential expansion in terms of access from other communities. Uh, one of the things that I did not mention before is, is that if we bring North Star to St. Cloud, you open up another at least hour's travel time around St. Cloud and there is a significant population. I have had contacts from people as far as Wilmer that have said that if the train comes to St. Cloud, it is very likely that they would use it. Uh, so there is a significant advantage to having that information information ahead of time so that we can design the whole system to accommodate. I mean, I'm even looking at the possibility of taking the North Star Link and using it to other cities, but this is what we would have to find out from the study because that would then enable us to most efficiently focus the dollars where they should go. Uh, unfortunately, we have a habit if we have $6 million laying around and we're not sure what to do with it, we'll find a way to spend it. I would much rather have it focused directly on what we are going to try to accomplish here. Senator Dibble. Thank you, uh, thank you, Senator Ralph. Um, and then on the, on the legislative report, uh, subdivision two, starting on line 1.21, going through 2.15, or sorry, 2.10. Uh, uh, can we assume that that legislative report will occur as a function of the uh, analysis uh, and assessment and review that's called for in subdivision one? Or um, why, why would we not want um, the legislative report uh, on the assessment, the status overview, timeline, stakeholders, project finances, recommendations? Senator Ralph. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Dibble, I believe the idea here is is that we want this to move quickly. So we want to get the legislative report by the by October 2020. And in fact, if it can be done sooner, that would be even better. But the idea here is is that the information that's set forth in the second part of the bill is is the key information that will be reported. There is simply a revised report if there are, uh, is other information. I am hopeful that the report will be complete as it is, as it is prepared. So, Senator Dillon. I'm slightly unclear. Our, so a report is going to occur, um, and so we don't need the language in subdivision two? Um, Senator, Senator Ralph. I believe, I believe what this is is to allow the opportunity for additional information to be provided if there is a revision. And that, that's my, my, my best explanation. The, 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 the main operating part of this is uh, the, the legislative report that we would have to tell us whether this, what we, where we want to put the money. And I, I think, again, the object here is to try and determine the most efficient way to spend the public dollars once that judgment is made. So, Mr. Chair. Senator Dibble. But, Senator Ralph, but, but that report, the requirement for that report is, is eliminated in your A1 amendment. No, I believe the A1 amendment so, simply Senator takes Ralph. out um, line 7A. Because it had to do with the status project. Senator Ralph, uh, Senator Dibble, I'm going to have the Stengel. Uh, try and answer your question for you. All right, thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, the legislative report you see in subdivision two of the bill was eliminated by the A1 amendment. Um, 
And the reason being is that the report, if you look at the things that were related to it, have to do with the status of the project and those sorts of things. Um, sorry, uh, completely different train of thought here. Um, I think uh, you're correct. It is eliminated in the amendment. Um, there are a couple of ways if you would like that uh, legislative reporting to be put back in, you could reinsert subdivision two or you could add something to the end of subdivision one that says the study must be reported to the legislature. Mr. Chair, I, I, I apologize. I did not pick up on that when I, when I got this. I had, I had assumed this was just striking section three. And that was the, that was the idea, was to remove section three, which is the bonding. Gentlemen, as a, as a, just a suggestion, this bill will be laid over, and if there's some further work mm -hmm. that needs to be done uh, regarding this report, perhaps we could do that offline. Mm -hmm. uh, I do want mm -hmm. to move forward, because we've got other bills that we really have to uh, address. So uh, I've got Senator Senjaman, Senator Carlson up next. If you could be brief, please. Senator Senjaman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and just a quick one. Uh, I, I'm recalling downtown St. Cloud, uh, to the extent I'm able, uh, do the, do the tracks, uh, would the tracks come to your transportation hub or would we need a depot, a, a new depot uh, to accommodate this kind of? Succinctly, issue? Senator Ralph. Mr. Chair and Senator Senjum, it would come right to the Amtrak depot, oh, which is, right. in, which is downtown right. okay. uh, in the east side of St. Cloud. Okay. Uh, uh, and then uh, the Senator second one, is, is it conceivable that, uh, that we might also serve the St. Cloud Airport with a stop? I mean, the study would dictate this, I understand, but. Senator Ralph. Is that uh, reasonable to think? Mr. Chair and Senator Sengem, I believe the report would show that there is a there is actually a parking area on the east side of St. Cloud that's right on the road to the airport, so it's possible something could be done there. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Senator Carlson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a question for uh, Mr. Qualley. Um, you mentioned uh, that this is a, a highly developed line, and you mentioned also that there is PTC on this line. And uh, there's been some media reports in the last week here about uh, PTC being uh, not completely uh, implemented. And because we have passenger rail on the same rails as we have freight rail, is this PTC complete? Is it something that uh, both uh, BNSF and uh, the Met Council are involved in and are talking to each other? Mr. Qualley. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Carlson, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Seeing no other uh, uh, questions, uh, Senator Ralph, it would be our intention to leave this bill over. If you have any, have any brief final thoughts, fine. Otherwise, we're just going to lay the bill over. Uh, no, I believe we've presented it, and I want to thank Senator Dibble for catching that error. I, have, uh, that, that, I apologize for that. Th thank you very much, uh, Senator. And with that, uh, Senate File 1892 is laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, next up on the docket is Senator Franzen's bill, Kim. Senate File 1122. Uh, if you recall, members, this is a continuation of a previous uh, hearing uh, where uh, Senator Franzen didn't get the opportunity to uh, complete her, her presentation. And uh, we've got uh, Senator Franzen at the testifying table. We also have Mr. Buckeye from MnDOT. Uh, who has kindly come back uh, to talk to us about this issue. So to begin with, I would recognize Mr. Buckeye and ask him to uh, please proceed with your testimony. Identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Ken Buckeye. I'm program manager with the Office of Finance at the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Minnesota's work on uh, mileage-based user fees has been conducted at the direction of the legislature and in cooperation with the Federal Highway Administration and has informed, been informed by our own research and the experience of other states. Let me recap uh, some of what we have done. The Mileage-Based User Fee Policy Task Force, which completed its work in 2011, produced a series of findings and recommendations on how to move forward. Two road use fee demonstrations using state-of-the-art technology have been completed in Minnesota, um, and an exhaustive evaluation of that work is available. MnDOT 
commissioned the University of Minnesota to conduct an important study titled Transportation Futures, which considered several significant trends that are rapidly converging, car sharing, auto automation, and electrification. By all indications, it's not a matter of if, uh, is a matter of if these trends are going to mature, but rather how quickly adoption takes place. Our analysis of road use charging projects in the U.S. and around the world reveals that there are many similar challenges, including equity, privacy protection, public acceptance, transparency, evasion, and very importantly, burdensome administrative costs. Building on those sites and the findings and conversations with members of the House and Senate Transportation Committee, MnDOT, along with our, our partners at the Department of Revenue and the University of Minnesota, has designed a uh, pilot to demonstrate an efficient and rational distance-based user fee collection system that may be used to charge certain vehicles by miles driven. This project will ultimately demonstrate a user-based fee with shared mobility service, um, such as car sharing businesses. This may include 200 vehicles and several thousand subscribers. Shared mobility is an emerging modal trend that is already dramatically changing how people move around. Existing technology embedded in these vehicles, location software, communications, and GPS can be used to capture and report necessary distance information without invasion of privacy, uh, in individuals' privacy. This fee collection model is enabled by onboard telematics that is rapidly becoming the standard for all new vehicles. And we believe the cost of administration can be reduced significantly given the economies of this model. To be clear, we recognize the importance of retaining the motor fuel tax for a long time to come. Replacing the motor fuel tax with a distance-based user fee on all of today's fossil fuel vehicles is unrealistic and financially and administratively unachievable. Therefore, the motor fuel tax should remain in place for the majority of vehicles on the road today. Our project envisions a measured and incremental move toward demonstrating an equitable, efficient, and enforceable distance-based user fee model one that represents a migration and not a transformation to the future of automation, electrification, and shared mobility. Senate File 1122 aligns with the legislative authority MnDOT received for phase one design of our current distance-based user fee project plan. Upon submission of the phase one work to federal highways, Minnesota was awarded a million dollars in federal funding for a demonstration that must be matched by the state. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Mr. Buckeye, uh, you indicated that uh, mileage-based user fee would not be applicable to vehicles using fossil fuels. I assume by that you mean it would be applicable to electric, uh, electric cars. Would that be correct? It, it would be applicable to electric cars and, in some case, shared mobility services, perhaps. But in addition, um, newer um, fossil fuel vehicles will also have the technology that if, if decision makers should decide to move to a distance-based fee with those newer um, fossil fuel vehicles, that would be a possibility as well. That would be something, Mr. Buckeye, that would occur in the future then, I take it? Mr. Chair, yes, that would occur in the future. Um, we have uh, today, as part of our first phase project plan, completed a, a proof of concept with a local uh, car share provider that lays the groundwork for how that might be accomplished. Uh, and that local car share provider does currently use very high efficiency fossil fuel vehicles. Um, it involved collecting that information off that shared uh, service vehicle that technology that's embedded in that vehicle, that, that information was then um, sent to a, a secure uh, server, and that information then was accessed, processed, and a simulated um, invoice was then sent for those miles traveled.
to the car share provider, not to individual, to an individual. Thank you, uh, Mr. Buckeye. Senator Rarick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, you would use some GPS to kind of keep track of miles. Do you envision this would also be able to allow you to look at miles that are driven, say, within a city jurisdiction or a township jurisdiction or a county road to be able to help divert funds to where actual usage is in the future? Mr. Buckeye. Mr. Chair, Senator, um, the technology that's on board these vehicles and future vehicles will have a tremendous capability to do those kinds of things if that was the desire. Um, on the other hand, if the desire is just to simulate the replacement of travel as we do today with uh, fossil fuels and the, and the motor fuel tax, that too is possible. That's a much more simplified way of doing it, but clearly the technology would allow us to be very precise in how and where we collect uh, those miles driven. Any other questions by any other members? Senator Frenz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Franzen. Nice job on this. Uh, Mr. Buckeye, the question is, if we're talking about Minnesota revenue, how do out-of-state drivers coming onto our roads affect our planning if we're moving in this direction? And would we be able to capture revenue from out-of-state drivers in the same way that we do with the fuel tax? Mr. Buckeye. Mr. Chair, Senator, again, um, one of the, the major tenets of our proposal is out-of-state drivers would, if they have a fossil fuel vehicle, would continue to purchase fuel in Minnesota if, if they happen to have a, a fossil fuel vehicle. If, on the other hand, they were, they were driving a, um, um, a vehicle with this new technology on board, um, <coughs> the possibility exists that we would then have to um, uh, share agreements with adjoining states to collect uh, and exchange revenue that might be collected in our own state. Any other questions by members? Seeing none, Senator Franzen, uh, final comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to just highlight um, that there is a, a fiscal note that was, I believe, uh, distributed to other members. If, if you'd like uh, Ms. Yeah. Boyd to go through it. Uh, Senator Franzen, yes, we, we have received it. Uh, I will tell you candidly, I haven't read it yet, but uh, uh, we will. Okay. And then finally, Mr. Chair, um, we, given the, the demonstration project um, was applied to at the federal level, uh, I do have copies of that from members if members are interested in seeing what that would look like um, because it's not just starting from scratch. There were learnings from the 2011 um, task force and certainly the application for the funds at the federal level to bring those dollars in needed to have some documentation. And I do have copies of that I can make available for the committee members. Uh, and then with that, I think um, we'd like to, to support to just start looking at this issue um, as it becomes available in the future. That could be uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, or 20 years from now. Um, it, things are moving really rapidly when it comes to technology, so it's good that we had the discussion here of what this can look like, and thank you for engaging on your questions. Uh, Senator Franzen, thank you very much for bringing this forward. It, it is an, an issue that... that uh, uh, I think it's important that we explore, and I think uh, the committee has has learned uh, about this issue just by reason you bringing the bill forward. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Senator Senjum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is really intriguing. I, 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 and so I, I'm just going to ask, is the, tech, the, te the technology within 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 cars, at least newer cars, <laughs> is, is apparently already here. Is, is that correct? Mr. Buckeye. Or Mr. anticipated Chair, soon? Senator, um, that technology is already here on a lot of models, um, and manufacturers are making commitments um, to install the, that technology and more in, on future vehicles. Uh, Ford manufacturers, uh, for all Ford vehicles by 2022 will have 5G capability, which is the, the most advanced wireless that's now available, and that 5G capability will have a tremendous capacity to um, help us collect efficiently and effectively and, and manage this uh, system very, uh, very well. 
Oh, thank you. I, I'll just leave it there. I think this is intriguing. Senator. I think we need to talk about it more. Okay. <laughs> Anything further, Senator Franzen? That's it, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, Senate File 1122 is laid over. Next on the docket is Senator Jasinski's bill, uh, Senate File 621. And just to give uh, members a heads up, we have uh, eight testifiers that have signed up to testify on Senator Jasinski's bill. Uh, and we will, it would be my intention to go through the various testifiers and then come back to the members uh, with questions. Uh, Senator Jasinski, I understand you have an A2 amendment. Is that an author's amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, the A2 is an author's amendment, and I would request that be passed. Uh, Senator Jasinski moves the A2 amendment as an author's amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The uh, motion uh, is adopted and the amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Jasinski, to your bill, 621 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I first of all want to start by saying I think this is my most important bill of the year. Uh, this bill, as you all know, uh, was uh, vetoed last year, a variation of this for $9 million. Uh, this morning, about an hour and a half ago, the governor signed the Minlars bill, and that's great. And we got that uh, money available for the Minlars to be completed and get back operational and make progress towards that. But a bill that you're here today is 621. This will give a relief to the deputy registers who've been harmed uh, since July of 2017. Uh, this bill is a separate bill for deputy registers. I know there's some discussion on towing association, the auto salvagers, the auto auctioneers, auto dealers, uh, but I believe the deputy registers who are core users of this software have been most adversely uh, affected by this. So I know I have a lot of testifiers here. I know you've heard this before, so I won't go on. I'd like to hear from the testifiers, and then I'll make some closing comments in the end. So with that, I entertain my uh, first testifier this morning. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Um, if Mr. Vassen would please approach the testifying table uh, and to get ready for his testimony, uh, I would uh, recognize Mr. Hertz uh, as the first testifier. Mr. Hertz, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself uh, for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. For the record, my name is Jim Hurst. I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Deputy Registrars Association, a trade association representing the vast majority of all deputy registrars in the state. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, uh, Senator Jasinski and, uh, and the co-authors on this bill for bringing this forward. Uh, my comments will be uh, brief uh, because I'm sure you've heard them uh, before, but uh, let me start by saying that uh, deputy registrar compensation is, is urgently needed, um, and uh, we support Senate File 621 as amended uh, that uh, uh, helps us towards that uh, goal. I think it's important to, to point out that uh, the $10 million uh, that uh, is envisioned in this uh, should be considered uh, uh, towards the first year of, of operations with Minlars. Uh, we are now entering, uh, I believe, uh, starting the eighth month of the second year of Minlars. Uh, but I think the $10 million uh, that is envisioned here uh, does a, uh, uh, certainly puts a large dent into what the costs the deputies have inc uh, incurred in that first year. The MDRA uh, did do some uh, fiscal impact surveys uh, a year ago. Uh, the first impact uh, survey asked uh, the members to uh, to share with us total costs pertaining to lost revenue from uh, lost transactions as well as uh, additional labor costs. That first uh, survey, uh, which was reflective of the first five months of Minlars in the first five years when uh, uh, extended out, suggested an impact of about $10.5 million. 
and that was with participation from about 65% of all offices in the state. We followed up with that survey with, with another survey with the same questions uh, to uh, try and confirm the assumptions on that first survey. Again, it was now for the first full year. Uh, that survey largely confirmed that amount, slightly, slightly less than that, but we also had fewer participation of, uh, of uh, uh, individual offices participating in that study. But uh, I want to close by saying while the compensation measure is, is seriously needed uh, for the deputy registrars to address the costs that they have incurred already, um, as we look forward, we certainly do not want in future sessions to keep coming back to uh, this body uh, seeking additional compensation. And to that end, uh, I... Uh, encourage this panel to understand that in addition to the compensation that is um, within this bill to also recognize the need for filing fee increases for the deputies uh, going forward. And to that, uh, I thank Senator Senjum, who is the chief author of that bill. I believe it's Senate File 1124 that has very reasonable filing fee increases to address uh, the reality that uh, uh, the deputies are, are facing going forward. It also recognizes the fact that those filing, fee the, those filing fees have not been adjusted in eight years uh, for motor vehicle transactions. And uh, I think it's incumbent that we look upon this as, as this being one of, of two needed measures uh, this session before the legislature. Uh, with that, I will conclude my remarks and certainly welcome any questions that the members may have. Mr. Hurst, what's the amount of the fee increase requested by the deputy registrars? Uh, the fee increase uh, request uh, is uh, for your tab renewals, uh, an increase of $2.50. Uh, currently, that filing fee is $6. The filing fee increase for title transactions is $3.50. I'm sorry? $3.50 for, for title transactions. Currently, title <coughs> transactions have a $10 filing fee. Uh, in addition, uh, some of you may recall that uh, a year ago, uh, deputies were, were, uh, were granted the ability to print on-site duplicate titles. Um, and, uh, and therefore, customers coming in seeking a duplicate title could uh, walk out of our office with the actual document. Uh, that uh, would be subject to a, uh, what's called a, a, an expedited fee, but that would be uh, $10 only in addition for those individuals who opted to seek uh, an expedited uh, service of this nature with a duplicate title in hand when they walk out of the office. Uh, again, that's optional and just limited to that case. Uh, lastly, uh, driver's license is another uh, aspect of our business. And certainly with uh, uh, Real ID, there has been uh, a lot more work uh, involved as far as the deputies uh, 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 processing those applications. Uh, currently, the fee is $8 and we are seeking a $4 increase to make that $12. Uh, and uh, I should mention, uh, Mr. Chairman and others, uh, we base these increases on what are called time and motion studies that the Deputy Registrar Association has, has conducted. We were uh, mindful that uh, uh, we took time and motion studies prior to the launch of Minlars, so that we had a good bait and benchmark so that we knew what to um, uh, judge this on. And then subsequently, we did time and motion studies after uh, Minlars was released. I'll be honest, we did one about, uh, I believe it was two or three months after Minlars was released, uh, and that uh, coincided with a, uh, with a uh, release that uh, did not go so well, shall we say, and so the numbers were very, vastly skewed. We recognize that. We did another survey, a uh, time and motion study, uh, when uh, there was no uh, uh, patch in the works, so to speak, or a fix to Minlars, and, uh, and based on that, 
it largely confirmed what we had heard earlier from uh, the state agencies and that uh, uh, the workload that uh, uh, to a certain degree w was done largely by uh, the state was shifted over to, to the deputies. Our time in motion studies uh, confirm that uh, to the range of roughly between 30 to uh, 45 percent uh, additional time involved. Well, thank so, you for that, Mr. Hurst, and, and I'm sure in the, in the, the, the next bill where the fee increases are uh, included, we will explore that in, in more depth. I'm not trying to cut you off. I just wanted to get an idea of the fee increases. So thank you very much for that testimony. Uh, if Christy Bocage would please uh, come up and have a, a seat uh, at the testifying table. Uh, and I would recognize Mr. Vossen. State your full name for the record, please, Mr. Vossen, and proceed. That's Donnie Vossen from Brandon, Minnesota, Deputy Registrar. So. Please proceed. Um, as Jim said, yes, uh, the deputy's actually been going on two years toward Midlands. So everything started for us in April of 2017, and uh, basically that's where the losses started because that's where the, uh, all the extra training and overtime started. Uh, Above and beyond that, though, I've spent over $25,000 restructuring my office to create a new workflow because everything is different in the office. I've added additional workstations, computers, printers, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. My payroll has gone up between $1,000 and $1,500 a week. My overtime is way up. It's a good thing my wife and I own the office together. It's a good thing we're committed to working almost every weekend to minimize that because it's going to reach a point we're probably going to be committed. The value of my business has plummeted. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if, what the value is anymore because who would want this headache? Uh, we got into this business in the first place like capitalist America. You buy a business, you want to build it up, you want to sell it for your retirement or find somebody to run it for you through your retirement. Well, there again, nobody would want it at this point. Uh, most of these losses have already been addressed, but here's a list of other expenditures that you should be aware of. My office alone has lost 15 employees since April of 2017. That is hundreds of years of experience. That is expensive. Uh, the gentleman at the DNR that creates the logons for new employees says he goes through an average of two new employees a day for deputy registrars. That's a lot of employees to keep continually losing. Uh, I've lost time away from my wife, time away from my daughter, uh, time no longer spent with my friends. I've lost good business customers who believe this is my fault. Uh, I've lost dealers who think this is my fault. I've lost numerous employees mm -hmm. to six days, sick days due to their stress. I uh, watched my staff lose their confidence. We don't even know what we know anymore. I've lost too many weekends, too many evenings, too many early mornings. Uh, I can't count how many times my wife and I stayed late to catch up with all the things we previously were able to do on our regular schedule before Minlars. I've lost camping trips with my family, hunting trips with my friends. I even lost one dog because we didn't have the time or energy to attend to his needs. I had to put him down. Do I blame men large for that? Yes, I do. Because otherwise I would have had the time to take care of him. I've lost sleep night after miserable men large night. I've lost happiness and relaxation. I've lost the ability at the end of the day to feel this was a job well done. Now let's also try to calculate how much health I've lost. They say stress takes a lot of time off your life. How much have I lost? How expensive is that? W not just me, but other deputies and, and their staffs. Um, me, so many deputies, their employees as well as state employees are also losing the ability to care. That is one of the biggest losses the state of Minnesota cannot afford. What is the monetary value on that? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, if uh, Ms. Kelly Davison would please come to the table, and uh, while she's coming up, uh, Ms. Bocage, if you would identify yourself for the record, who you are with, and proceed with your testimony, please. Thank you, and good job pronouncing my last name. <laughs> uh, my name is Christy Bocage, and um, I'm with uh, Dep my parents actually own the business or the deputy in South St. Paul, so I'm here with that as well as. The Deputy Registrar's Business Owners, Business Owners Association, which makes up about 72 of the deputies out there, which are privately owned small businesses. Um, I just really thank you so much for letting us talk again today. And thank you, Senator Jasinski, so much for bringing this forward. I know you've heard about this over the last year and a half, and I just want to take a couple moments to just elaborate on a few things, um, just to kind of 
give you some more information. Um, as you've heard us talk about it over the last year and a half, we are the ones who work in our offices and we have to do what we can to make the transactions go through. We meet with DVS on a regular basis, we test the system, we provide them feedback in hopes that it will get better. So we will make it better than in our offices so that we can help whatever transactions the citizens do come to us for. I wanna take a moment to explain a little bit how we get paid because I still find that a lot of citizens don't understand and they come to me or in my offices and say, you know, how is it that you're not making this large amount from this tab? You know, I, it was $500 for my MKX or something. I only get $6 out of that transaction. So we collect a fee, as you heard a little bit of Mr. Hurst talking about. We collect the $6 for the tabs or the registration. We collect $10 for title transfers and $8 for driver's license. The more you can do in a short period of time, if you can think about the business model that we've been trying to do, the more you can do, the more you're able to make your bills. So let me explain some of the bills that we as private business owners have to, have to pay for. We have to pay our payroll, obviously, medical benefits, rent, insurance, including cyber security insurance, bonds that the state requires that I have to carry at my office, phone, computer equipment, printers, supplies, and now I even have to pay for the duplicate title stock that I offer. So I continue to pay for more and more things, so my costs continue to go up. And as you can imagine, as Mr. Hurst already talked about, and you'll hear some of us deputies talk about, it takes longer and longer to do these transactions. So how, how am I going to make this money? How am I going to pay for these bills when I'm making less of that $6, less of that $8, and less of that $10 than I used to make? So we've been trying over the past year and a half to figure out how to make it go faster so that we can pay these bills as I talked about, and it isn't working. We have a family business. My parents own the business. And we saved $150,000 for a rainy day. Well, it has been pouring, as you can imagine, for a year and a half. We are down to $45,000 in our savings account. Just this week, I had to take another $2,000 to pay my payroll to make sure my people get their money, which they deserve. They're working very hard. We used to be able to complete 600 apps a day. Now, with the same number of staff, I can only do about 300. So effectively, I've doubled my staff. That's a lot. Our costs have skyrocketed, our income has decreased, and as Donnie alluded to, the value of our businesses has plummeted. Our offices are bower other offices are borrowing against their homes, their life insurance, you may have heard stories of that, and they're doing anything that they can to stay alive. We keep using our own money to make Minlars work and make Minnesota work, really. So we talk about being one Minnesota, and we are working really hard to do that. We are working with legislators, we are working with testing the system, and we're doing whatever we can creatively to make this work. So I am here imploring you to pass this bill for us to get a reimbursement now as soon as possible, and again, I just thank you so much. But also, as you talked, uh, as Mr. Hurst was talking about, something different in the future, because that reimbursement will be like a blessing. But it will go quickly, because as you heard, all these costs continue to go up, and we'll be right back where we were. So we need to look at something different for compensation. I so appreciate you allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Senator Jasinski, uh, uh, we received a handout. Uh, who did that, who prepared that? Uh, oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I'm Mr. Davison. We're with... coming to it, I understand. Yes, we're coming to it. And I apologize that the page acted a little bit faster than I expected, so that is for the next testifier, Ms. Davison. We, have, have, we have good page uh, service. Uh, Mr., or I'm sorry, Ms. Bacchus, if you would please come up to the testifying table at this time. Uh, and I would recognize Ms. Davison, if you would uh, identify yourself for the record and please proceed. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank Senator Jasinski for bringing this forward, as it's greatly needed. My name is Kelly Davison, and I'm the owner of the Prior Lake License Bureau. This is the second year coming here begging for your help and support with regards to the Minlars Massacre. Last year, I testified that I had put retirement monies into my business to keep my doors open. I also had to reduce my business hours by two hours per day so that I could have my entire staff there bell to bell. I hired five new employees in preparation for Minlars because I knew the system was going to take a bit longer 
and we were trying to offset our customer wait times by having more people to serve them. Little did we know how broken and incomplete that system was and is. We fully support a third party independent expert review on the system to tell us if it can even be fixed. This year I've had to take a loan from my life insurance policy so that I can keep paying my employees. Even after hiring five new people, we still can't keep up with our premium and large transaction counts. This also means less money to the state in a timely manner. Don Olson from DBS took a guess and admitted transferring 40% of DBS's work onto deputies. The deputies hired an independent firm that conducted a time and motion study, and the study showed at that time the deputies are doing 62 to 80% more work. Our business partners at DBS knew transactions would take twice as long or more and still did nothing to off, help offset this. The deputies, even pre Lars, have always been on the front line taking care of our citizens. We're the point of contact. We're the ones doing the work and getting you your taxpayer dollars for these accounts on behalf of the state. What I absolutely do not understand is that DBS and Minute keep getting emergency funds continually for staff and Minlars, but the deputies have gotten no help and are using personal monies, retirement, loans, credit cards, mortgaging homes, and borrowing against life insurance policies. Cities and counties are robbing taxpayer dollars from other areas so they can survive as well. Between payroll expenses and loss of transaction, Productivity, my office is sitting at a 1413161 and a penny loss. It feels as though you're biting the very hands of the people doing all of the work and collecting all of the motor vehicle tax dollars for you. It just doesn't make sense. Please do the morally right thing and give us our emergency reimbursement monies. We can no longer wait and we've been put off for long enough. I beg you to please stop playing with our lives and our businesses. The deputies have been financially devastated from Minlar's system at no fault of our own, and we need all of your support. As Senator Newman said yesterday, you have the ability to get things done quickly if you need to, and, and you need to, because we need it. I wanted to make a note on my, my spreadsheet that I handed out. So the loss of 900 transactions per week cost me 7650 7, per week. What that means to you is that you are losing over a million dollars that my office could be sending you per week. 900 transactions is what that equals to the state of Minnesota. Since I purchased a business in December of 2003 from my brother, my office has collected almost $1 billion in taxpayer dollars for the state of Minnesota at no cost to the state. I think that's pretty substantial, and I'm pretty proud of that. Thank you for your support. Ms. Davison, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, I would indicate that uh, please remember that uh, the legislature last year did provide $9 million in funding, and that funding was vetoed. We are now back this year, and you are absolutely correct. The legislature can move quickly when it wants to, and uh, we are now addressing the deputy registrar's issues, and uh, we fully intend to move quickly. Thank you so much. It is so needed. Very, thank you very much. Uh, if uh, Ms. Julie Hansen would come to the testifying table, please, uh, I would recognize Ms. Backus. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Amber Backus, and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Automobile Dealers Association and its 373 franchise new car and truck dealers located across the state. Uh, we are here as well to support Senate File 621 and hope you consider it with the same urgency as you did yesterday's Minlar's uh, deficiency bill. 
Um, as Ms. Davidson referenced, and you just heard an exchange with the chair, we are 21 months into a system, and we've infused $15 million for the computer part, um, but we have not had the opportunity yet to do the same for the deputy registrars, and they're really the ones who have suffered and sacrificed the most from the failed launch. They are still carrying significant financial losses due to no fault of their own, as you heard, and the prospects for making up revenue are still far away. As new functionality is being added to the system, such as the ability to transfer specialty plates, but it does not streamline those processes and transactions, and it's added steps that are time-consuming and difficult to figure out, further burdening their productivity. And has also been referenced, beyond making significant financial sacrifices to muster through MINLARS, many deputy registrars have volunteered additional hours away from the office to attend stakeholder meetings on a weekly or biweekly basis. They've been involved in performing user acceptance testing, and they've worked on Sundays on their day off to do the go-live testing before some of the releases that have come out. They've not asked for additional compensation to take on these tasks, and they probably should receive some, but they are so committed to getting a working system that will allow them to serve and retain their customers. We truly, as auto dealers, appreciate Senator Newman thinking that other adversely impacted stakeholders should also be a part of the comp uh, compensation conversation. Our dealers have suffered financial losses since the loss of Midlars, conservatively in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, but these collective losses have not put our dealers on the brink of bankruptcy as Minlars has for the deputy registrars. We believe that the biggest threat to our dealers is if the trusted deputies, our partners, can no longer take dealer business because they're so overwhelmed or they have to close the doors because they can't hold on any longer. That would be most detrimental to serving Minnesotans. Um, so we really appreciate the work of the deputies in bringing this bill forward, and we hope that since they are the front line of the motor vehicle titling and registration system, um, that their health is restored with um, some infusion of money to help them. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Backus. Uh, if uh, Stephen Huser would please come to the testifying table, uh, and uh, I would recognize uh, Ms. Hansen, uh, if you would please identify yourself, who you are with, and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Julie Hansen. I am a deputy registrar for the Scott County, um, but I am here today representing the Minnesota Association of County Officers. MAKO definitely supports this bill as amended. The need, as we've heard today, for deputy reimbursement is now, both for public and private deputy offices. Counties and cities have been forced to levy for these losses, but as you've heard with the impassioned testimony here today, private offices have no recourse and have been forced to devastate their personal finances through no fault of their own. While MAKO is an organization of county offices, I hope my presence and testimony here today highlights the unified relationship that both public and private offices have, and I thank you for your time today. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Huser, if you would state your full name and, uh, and who you represent, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Stephen Huser and I represent Metro Cities. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today on Senate File 621. Uh, Metro Cities supports Senate File 621 and would like to thank Senator Jasinski for carrying it. Uh, issues with the rollout of the new state licensing and registration system, or MINLARS, have caused uh, caused significant disruptions to service provided by city-operated registrar offices, and in some cases, city registrars ha are having to turn to other local revenue sources, such as the property tax, to manage these issues. There are registrar offices located throughout the state, or city-run registrar offices located throughout the state, with 11 city-run registrars in the metropolitan area. Metro Cities supports funding to compensate deputy registrars for costs associated with the implementation and processing burdens associated with the new system. Um, I want to thank you again and to express our support for Senate File 621. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. One moment.
my apologies, uh, Senator Jasinski. Uh, just a logistical problem. Um, I, I would say that it would appear at this time that we will not get to Senate File 620, which is a slow-moving vehicle uh, file, and I see that uh, we have uh, state troopers here to testify, and I just wanted to let you know that we aren't going to make it on that file. Uh, uh, yet th this, the bill that we are currently working on, uh, I think is, is very, very important. Uh, and I do want to continue, even though we're beginning to run out of time. Uh, so at, at this point, are there questions? We have now come to the end of our, our testifiers. Are there questions uh, for Senator Jasinski or any of the testifiers from members of the committee? Senator Senjum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to, to be clear, or maybe uh, help me understand, uh, would this bill uh, reimburse uh, public deputy registers or just private deputy registers? Mr. Chair and Senator Newman. Senator Jasinski. Uh, this bill would uh, reimburse the private business owners, the cities and the counties, but not the state offices. Okay, thank you. Senator, Senator Newman. Mr. Er, Mr. Senator Jasinski. Also, one other uh, thing I would offer at this time, listening to the testifiers, uh, line 2.19 effective date, I would like to make an oral amendment that this is effective date is upon enactment. That's funny. One moment. Senator Jasinski, that is already in the A2 that we adopted. I'm sorry, I have the wrong copy. Thank you. You're ahead of yourself as usual. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to make sure it didn't get passed by. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Jasinski, do you know in the last uh, 21 months or a year and a half or almost two years now, how many um, deputy registers have basically had to close their doors? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson. I do not know. I believe maybe Mr. Hurst may have information on that. If he would like to return to the stand, but I do not have the uh, exact amount. Mr. Hurst. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, Jim Hurst on behalf of the Minnesota Deputy Registrar's Association. Uh, to your question, Senator Anderson, uh, it is my understanding that one uh, uh, county office in uh, uh, Newmarket, Elko, uh, did close, uh, as well as another uh, county office in Monoman County, but it's my understanding the office in Monoman has since reopened. Uh, that's the uh, uh, extent of my knowledge as far as any uh, uh, closers at, at this point. Mr. Chair. S Senator Anderson. And Mr. Hurst. So those people on Elko Newmarket, you, you mentioned, where do those uh, individuals have to go then to get help? Mr. Hurst. Mr. Chairman and Senator Anderson. Deputy Registrar offices are, are also bound by uh, uh, distance requirements. Uh, so a short answer to your question, uh, I, I believe the, the distance involved would be uh, somewhere in the range of perhaps 20 to 30 miles, I think, to the next closest uh, deputy office. Mr. Chair, it looks like we have another test. Yes, uh, Senator Anderson. Yeah, we've got it. We have a new test fire coming up. Uh, please state your name and, and uh, try and answer your, uh, Senator Anderson's question, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Anderson, again, my name is Julie Hansen. I'm the Deputy Registrar for Scott County. Um, thank you for asking that question. Actually, Elko New Market is one of my offices. So we were forced to close three days into Minlar's. Um, the customers in Elko New Market have other locations. We actually were opened um, via a special law that was passed. We had to waive the distance requirements. We're approximately seven miles from Lakeville. So the, the Lakeville office, the New Prague office, there are other offices close by, not as close obviously as we would have liked. Um, we maintained that office with one staff person there at a time, able to take a lunch break, you know, pre-Minlars. Uh, once the Minlars rollout happened, we very quickly realized that we could not maintain 
with that staffing level. Um, we have nine full-time staff at the Shakopee office, and we were forced to maintain or try to maintain the lines um, that occurred as soon as the Minlars rollout, we went from about a 20 minute wait to about an hour and a half at the Shakopee office. So unfortunately we were, we were forced to, to close that office. It is located in the library. There are other services offered there, um, but unfortunately not the deputy registrar services at this time. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Hansen, uh, Ms. Ms. Davidson, uh, said that she was losing 900 transactions a week because of the, the scenario here. How many transactions do you, was your office in Elko New Market uh, trying to hang on to or now had to go someplace else? Ms. Hanson. Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson, um, we are a very small office. The town of Elko New Market is less than 4,000. Um, we maintained an average of about three to 400 transactions a week total at that location. Um, so the fact that our office was there was more of a convenience for folks. We're located in a, um, an elder care facility as well. So it was more of a um, convenience for them versus a, I don't wanna say a money maker, we're not in the business to make money as a county, but um, more of a, a revenue generator than anything. Senator Dibble. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Jasinski, um, I was wondering if you could just help us understand uh, quickly the uh, kind of the apportionment, how the funds will be apportioned, the 50% and 50%. Um, it, it, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to understand that in contrast to um, the, the proposal we saw in the original form of, of House File 861 um, before we replaced it with our language and sent it back. Um, uh, the proposal coming from the other chamber that has this 10% uh, distributed equally with a 45% and a 45% uh, distribution. And if you'd consider that approach or not. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dibble. I'm gonna refer this Senator to Mr. Jasinski. Mr. Hurst as well on the technical side of this. I, I don't wanna make a mistake and I know he knows it much better than I do so. Mr. Hurst. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman and Senator Dibble. Uh, the distribution formula that is outlined in uh, this legislation uh, mirrors the formula that was present in legislation last year on, on compensation. Uh, I acknowledge that the uh, recent distribution formula uh, was a slight variation from this whereby 10% of the funds went equally to all offices and then the remaining 90% was evenly split along the ways of, of this formula. Uh, that, I believe, its genesis was in <coughs> different legislation that was considered last year, I, if memory serves me right, by Senator Westrom uh, in this body. Uh, from the standpoint uh, of the deputy registrars, I think it's important that uh, um, a formula along these lines, uh, uh, whether it be this version or the 10%, 45, 45%, uh, we are certainly open to, to other, either approach. I uh, don't wanna speak on behalf of the author, but I think he was looking at last year's formula, which this is reflective of. And in the grand scheme of things, I think the numbers almost bear out uh, the same, uh, whether it's uh, one formula or the other. Senator Jasinski. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dibble. Again, this, uh, my hopes is this gets passed and goes to finance, so I'm certainly looking to, we can look at that before it goes to finance and see if we wanna look at how we come up with that formula. Senator Dibble. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. No doubt there'll be more conversation um, in, in conference uh, as well. Um, so I look forward to that. I don't want to get into the details because I think it's kind of uh, complicated and technical. I did have another question very quickly, um, which is are some of the other elements, the required documentation um, uh, idea that, that House File 861 contains, um, the requirements, uh, the conditions um, to which deputy registrars are subject if they accept these dollars, the, the staying open, um, 
the um, uh, settlement and release from liability ideas, uh, et cetera, were those ideas that, that we've considered and are taking a look at? Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dibble. Uh, one of my concerns is the deputy registers have been put through so much and the documentation portion of this is just adding on to their pain, I believe. Uh, again, I'm open to some of the other language uh, as it goes to finance and looking at that, uh, but uh, the documentation portion, again, I, I, I believe as you've heard today by our testifiers, these deputy registers have been put through enough to add more documentation they're already doing on top of trying to maintain their business, I think is a, a overkill. I'd add to that uh, comment also that when I looked at uh, the uh, version from the other body regarding documentation, uh, the, the documents that were credible, were the credible wasn't really defined. So uh, it seemed to me to put the deputy registrars in a, in a position where they really wouldn't know what documents that they were supposed to provide. So I found that language somewhat problematic. Uh, some of the other language that was in the uh, in the House version, uh, I th thought merited uh, discussion, uh, specifically the the settlement and release language. But um, uh, the documentation that Senator Jasinski just referred to, I did find somewhat problematic. Senator Friends. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just want to add, uh, Senator Jasinski, I think the release is an important part of the, the program because what we're saying to deputy registrars is let us try to compensate you um, if you choose to participate. But you have another set of rights if outside of the bill if you don't want to participate mm -hmm. and you do not have to sign a release unless you look at the program and you say that is what we choose to do. And then the deputy registrar on their own volition says, I will participate in the program. The exchange for the state is that you would get a full and final release. So we're providing what we hope is a good option for DRs. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Friends. I agree. And again, at next stop, uh, going to finance, I'm open to that language and we'll research to see to make sure, and I'll speak with the deputy register on that, uh, to make sure that we have an agreement going forward. And uh, along, those, along those lines, uh, Senator Jasinski and, and Mr. Hurst, um, what I would really like to see in terms of the compensation for the deputy registrars would be a package that we put together that would be available to them. There's a mathematical formula uh, in Senator Jasinski's bill. I don't know if it's the right mathematical formula or not, but you know it's it's something that is certain, uh, so that we could compensate the deputy registrars for their damages to date, and then leave that program open for you know you know, maybe into next year so that they could um, be ultimately compensated out of this fund that we are creating. But what I don't want to have happen is, is to require them to come back next year and we entertain another bill which would be another DR compensation bill. I'd really like to do it in one bill if possible. Um, do, do you know whether the deputy registrars or the deputy registrar association would be open to that kind of a concept? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm, uh, I guess we would certainly, uh, would certainly be open to conversations on it. I, I'm a little bit of a loss as to the extent of that fund, how long it would run for, um, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, ideally what we want to do is return to our normal business model, whereby we're paid by the work that we do, which is through the filing fees. Uh, so I don't know if, if what you're suggesting is something well, in, in the talking of that. to the, uh, uh, the the governor and in talking to the two commissioners that are involved with the deficiency funding. Mm -hmm. Uh, for Menlars. Uh, it is anticipated that uh, the functionality of Menlars will be, for all intents and purposes, completed by the end of 2019. And then by the end of the fiscal year 2021, uh, all of the development and all of the transfer of knowledge for purposes of maintenance uh, and 
the maintaining of the system will be completed. But the the last two years is really the what they they call behind the curtain stuff that really isn't going to be involved in the functionality of the uh, uh, of the system for purposes of the the end users. So what I'm interested in is uh, you know, I think that we should reimburse the deputy registers now for their losses. I think that's really important. But I don't want to have this be, in effect, a down payment. I want a program put in place where they can submit their requests for reimbursement. But I don't want it to go on forever like the Minlar system has. And I don't want to uh, be entertaining another bill next year on DR reimbursement. I want to try and figure out a way to get it done all this year right now. And I would think that the deputy registrars would agree with me that it would be better to do that so that they know exactly where, where they are at. Uh, so I would ask that between uh, now, this bill is going to the Finance Committee. Uh, I would encourage you and the deputy registrars to visit with Senator Jasinski and see if you can come up with something along the lines of what Senator Friends has talked about and what I have talked about, so that we have one comprehensive bill that will uh, encapsulate uh, reimbursing the deputy registers for the problems that they have had. And we have a new uh, testifier has come to the table. Identify yourself, please. Yes. Uh, and uh, I'll who I'll you be represent very and, yeah. and uh, try and address yes. my kind of clumsy question. No, Mr. Chairman, for the record, Todd Hill with Hill Capital Strategies, and I'm here on behalf of the Private Deputy Registers Association. And I think we would support the concept that you're suggesting. The challenge is, as Mr. Hurst pointed out early on, this initial $10 million really only recovers the losses for the first year. And we are in year two now, and the losses, as, as Ms. Davison pointed out, continue to, to pile up. In her case alone, it's, it's in excess of a million dollars. And so I think we would be very eager to have a conversation about that, how that we would recover some of those losses from year one, how we look at year two, and how we move ahead in the future. And we would be very supportive of looking at that approach. Um, and, and you know, as I, we pointed out earlier, I think we tried to point out, there are some differences between the private deputy registers and the public deputy registers. And for the privates, we really have three issues. One is the money that we've lost from transactions. We've, we're producing substantially fewer transactions, and that's how we're paid. The second is the increased cost to try to perform the transactions that we have. And then we have a third area that has not been discussed much, but that is the business valuations for these businesses has been driven into the ground because of the, of the inability to perform our services. And so you have families who built these businesses up in an effort to pass them on to their children or to sell them for their retirement. And those, those businesses are now worth pennies on the dollar. And so if you want to have a comprehensive conversation about how to address this issue, we would be eager to participate in that. And we think that does that does make the most sense moving ahead. And, and um, Mr. Hill, you have, you have very clearly identified what has worried me the most uh, about this situation, is because this is an ongoing, uh, ever escalating um, compensation package. Uh, you know, we're dealing with, you know, not only the cost of Minlars, mm -hmm. Uh, but we're also dealing with the cost of reimbursing the deputy registrars. And, and you have identified now three different Correct. sources of loss of revenue and loss of value for them. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that we can uh, just pick out past losses, look at that, try and come up with a formula, and then we move on next year and pick up the next piece. Okay. Now, you are already into the second Correct. year. I would think that that would give you some background information mm -hmm. to help us out for uh, the, the second year. Uh, as to the value of the loss of, of business, that is a topic that should be discussed. Mm -hmm. However, please bear in mind what Senator Friends was making reference mm -hmm. to, is that uh, the deputy registrars are going to have to make a decision as to how they want to proceed. Do you want to proceed to collect from the fund that we are anticipating that we're going to put together for you? Mm -hmm and have access to that, uh, or you can uh, avail yourself of other remedies that are available to you, but I do not envision that you would be able to do both. Well, and I, I, uh, Senator Newman, uh, to that point, I, I think we agree with you. I, I think we understand that we, um, 
that the process that you're laying out, we agree with what Senator Friends is, is suggesting. Um, you know, the, the challenge is if it is a, if it is to sign off on, on this bill with $10 million, knowing that that really only covers losses year one, I think that does get to be a little bit scary for some of the deputy registers because their losses are in excess of that. The other point I would make is I think this is a comprehensive package, as Mr. Hurst pointed out. Uh, fee increases are going to have to be part of this discussion as well, and if we are able to right-size the fees, then I think these businesses will be able to turn the corner. They'll be able to generate back the revenue that they were generating, and hopefully their business values would increase over time. But these businesses are dependent upon the state of Minnesota to function. The state of Minnesota is our business partner, and you set the fees. We don't get to set the fees, so we can't adjust our revenue, and you provide us the system that we have to operate in, and the system that's been provided is horribly flawed. And so we are dependent upon you. We are your business partners, and we want to continue to have that conversation. Uh, this is a comprehensive package. It has to include, from my, from my client's perspective, some recognition of lost revenue um, and some ability to right-size these businesses and help them into the future. And if it's a package that includes that, I think we would be you know, happy to support that. The devil is certainly in the details, and um, believe me, I am as tired of coming here to talk about Minlars as everybody else in this room, and, and so are my clients. Well, uh, please don't misunderstand me. I am not, uh, by this conversation, suggesting that the $10 million figure uh, that is in this bill is the final figure. I'm simply trying to open up the door to get that discussion going as to what is that final figure and, and what is it going to look like. Uh, I would really like to move on this as, quick as, as quickly as possible uh, because I do appreciate the fact that we've got to get some money out the door to the deputy registrars. I really do understand that. But I don't want to be piecemealed to death uh, on the, the, because the deputy registrars is simply one portion of all of the money that this Minlars fiasco is going to cost us. And I think I have a responsibility to be conscious of uh, the, the whole global picture. And, it, and it's pretty frightening, uh, to be real honest. So that's what I really have in mind, and I would, I would absolutely urge the deputy registrars to engage with Senator Jasinski and, uh, and do it in a, in a kind of an aggressive manner, uh, because uh, this thing is going to finance. And anything that we do, as far as that money is concerned, has to be done in finance. Any other questions by any members? Uh, Senator Jasinski, final comments, uh, and then I would entertain your motion uh, to move your bill to the uh, Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, just listening to the testimony, and I know we've all heard it before, this is nothing new. Uh, we do need to do something for these deputy registers. I am in agreement, and thanks for the input of, of Senator Frentz and others uh, to make sure we get this language done. I will meet with the groups, to uh, the stakeholders, to reach an agreement, but I, the biggest thing that I've heard from a lot of deputy registers is we need some relief. We need some relief now because of what they've been gone through for the last uh, 21 months. So thank you again, and I appreciate your time today, and thank all my testifiers for coming again here here today. And uh, your motion, Senator Jasinski, Jiz regarding your bill as amended. I would, uh, re I would uh, pr recommend approval of uh, Senate file 621 and approve and uh, refer to finance as amended. Any further discussion? All those in favor of Senator Jasinski's motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The motion passes. And Senator Jasinski, you are on your way to finance. Thank you. With that, members, we are out of time. Again, I apologize that we didn't get to the other two bills. Uh, Senator Dibble, I will make sure that uh, you jump ahead of yeah. Senator Jasinski in the next. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to apologize to my constituents, and I acknowledge that you did not know they were here. The responsibility is mine from my office. We did not alert you that, uh, alert them that. Uh, Excuse me. Senator, yeah. uh, Senator Dibble has the yeah. floor. We are not yet adjourned. Senator Dibble. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I was just apologizing publicly to my constituents because we failed to let you know that they were here to testify today. So we will. I apologize for bringing you over here today. And I, I too, apologize to your constituents, uh, Senator Dibble. Uh, and I, and I uh, thank them for their indulgence, but I really did want to get through this bill today. So thank you, uh, Senator Dibble. With that, we are adjourned.